four four of this seven standby minute. Just come on. Uh, uh, what is your attack? Okay, right talk to him. See what that did. Charlie Hurst, eighty eight. Traffic two seven. Uh, 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 Eighty five just made a pass in there. Uh, two one seventy seven. Roger, sir, be advised, we have John Agrees, 2-1, okay, and 6-6 six, six standing by over our okay, I'll put it a little closer than those trees. Let me come around with a Lao 3, and I'll put it on those trees. There's, uh, Roger that, Lao 3. I was a young captain, and even though I was a captain, I had just come out of pilot training because I, went, I was commissioned, went to grad school, then went to pilot training. So I'm three years older than my lieutenant friends, but I have no more experience than they do because I just finished UPT. Holy cow. And uh, what was the unit you were flying with? What I was in the, the first Special Ops Squadron, the Hobos, which at that time was the last A-1 squadron. They had combined, when we would have parties, we would have guys in Zorro and Firefly party suits because they had changed down to one squadron a few months before I got there. Yeah, and I think we were going to talk about a search and rescue mission, a, a combat search and rescue, which is Ashcan. Uh, what was it, Ashcan? Ashcan zero one. Ashcan zero one. Could you lead me into that? Yeah, Ashcan was. By the time we got there, the Strike F one hundred fives had all gone home. They'd all been replaced by F fours, but there was a significant force in Thailand of F one hundred five G wild weasel airplanes, and these were the electronic jamming airplanes that were capable of both jamming an SA two SAM site and attacking it by shooting anti-radiation missiles. So if the site was tracking you with its radar, the missile basically homed on the radar antenna and, and blew it up. And so these wild weasels, which was their call sign, uh, were very integral to the strikes in North Vietnam because they were able, in some cases, to suppress the, the SAMs. And what happened was the North Vietnamese brought SA-2s down in further into Laos and in Mugia Pass, which was only 65 miles straight east of Nakhon Phanom, even though we were in Thailand, Laos was very narrow right there. Um, I was sitting Sandy Alert as Sandy One at NKP one day at about oh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon when a wild weasel who was supposedly suppressing the SAM site in Mugia Pass got shot down by that SAM site. And unbeknownst to us at the time, the airplane was so badly disabled that they ended up in a high-speed dive. And the, the front seater, the pilot, and the back seater, the electronic warfare officer, ejected at very high airspeed. Uh, and on the ground, once they got down, they were nobody could talk to him for a while and finally the pilot came up which was Ashcan 01 Alpha Alpha the front seat Bravo the back seat uh, but nothing from Bravo and the forward air controller that was out there was talking to the guy so we get scrambled and coming from NKP we're getting there pretty quick but we realize we're flying into an area where an SA2 has just shot down the airplane that we're going to try to run the rescue for Interesting thing about the SA-2 uh, is that it was a two-stage surface-to-air missile, and people used to describe them as looking at a telephone pole because it was so long and skinny. It did not guide until the booster stage burnt out and separated from the upper stage, and the guidance antenna was actually on the bottom of the upper stage and wasn't exposed until it separated, well, that happened between 10 and 12,000 feet. So you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that if you were below 10,000 feet, it was almost impossible for a SAM site to hit you because it was really designed as a high altitude interceptor and it didn't think it needed to guide until it was, you know, halfway to, to its target. So we understood that, we stayed below uh, below 10,000 feet, and arriving at Magia Pass, what we saw looking out the, the canopy was solid clouds on the ground. And the word we used to describe this kind of cloud cover was scud because it was literally molded to the shape of the ground. And I'm looking at my 1 to 250 map, and I can literally tell where the center of Magia Pass is just by looking at the shape of the clouds because the shape of the clouds 
are the same as the shape of the, of the hills. Could you describe Magia Pass for folks that aren't familiar? It was one of the most heavily contested areas because yes. it was a choke point. Yes. Magia had, the road came through this pass in the mountains and had karst limestone mountains on the west side, on the NKP side, that rose at least 1,500 feet above the, the floor of the valley. On the other side of the pass, the hills were lower, but it still forced the truck traffic to go through a fairly narrow point, but that was why it was so heavily defended by the North Vietnamese because they realized that their trucks were more vulnerable going through this three or four mile pass area than they were, you know, other times. So that was Mugia. And if you go ahead and tell us how the mission progressed from well, the Well, the, the, the OV-10 pilot from Nakhon Phanam, who was a, a, a pave nail, which was an OV-10 with a laser designator pod, so he could drop, he could put in laser guided weapons. He also had Loran navigation, which is an old Navy system that's worldwide, that's a low frequency, but it, it goes, it covers the whole globe. And so an OV-10 could point the laser at a spot on the ground and it would tell the pilot and the, the weapon systems operator in the back seat the exact location. So I flew around down low, just above the clouds, until the survivor said, you just passed me. And of course, I'm having my wingman help me get back to that same point. Remember, I'm flying over just white clouds, but you're trying to remember where that, and so we kind of did that, and I said to the fact, just lays that spot, you mean, within how far? We don't know, 100 yards, 300 yards. So we, we, know, we know the spot where the survivor is. So we're kind of frustrated because we are sitting there, I'm thinking, as the on-scene commander, that since the helicopter can't see the ground, there's no way to pull this rescue off. Well, what we knew was that it was far enough up in the high ground to the west of the pass itself that the probability of there being any enemy troops up on those mountains was very low. There was no reason for them to be there. They weren't part of the trail. They weren't, there wasn't a village, you know, they just, w and at this point, the low jolly pilot, Major Ken Ernst, who was one of the most outstanding jolly pilots I've ever encountered, Ken Ernst says to me on the radio, Sandy One, I think I can descend slowly through the clouds until I get to the treetops. The rotor wash of this giant H-53 will show me the trees in front of me, and I think I can hover on instruments and go along and maybe find him. So I said, well, let's try it. So Ken Ernst flies the jolly down there and starts in the direction toward the guy. And this is something that, to me, in looking back at it, I thought, I had this figured out instantly, even though it was one of those things that I don't remember anybody ever talking about or any of us ever worrying about. Okay, you've got a survivor on the ground, you've got a jolly green who can't see anything, he's just flying on instruments in the clouds, hovering along, how do you know how to help him? Well, what we did with three of us, Sandy 1, Sandy 2, and the OV-10, is we got in a circle above it, about 5,000 feet off the ground, with our automatic direction finding thing on. So each time one of them transmitted, the needle went and pointed toward that transmitter. So we'd say to the survivor, you know, give, give us a five second hold down on your, on your survival radio and say, okay. And then we do the same thing with the Jolly. Well, with all three of us doing that. So it's like a radio directional fire. Yeah, it was, we, 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 just, but, but think about it. Yeah. We're, we're doing it in our head. I, I'm doing it. I'm, since I'm, I'm supposedly yeah. <laughs> leading this dance, I'm leading this dance and I'm saying, okay, you know, 
you, you need to turn, you know, zero four zero. What, what's your heading now? Well, I'm at zero six zero. We could turn zero four zero, and we're vectoring Ken Ernst, and the survivor still can't hear him. So we know he's not real close to him. We did this for 45 minutes until Ken Ernst needed gas. So he comes, here comes this jolly up out of these white clouds, goes back to the C-130 Kingbird tanker and refuels. And there was never any consideration of having the high jolly go down there because I never would have told the jolly to do this had, had the jolly not said to me, I think I can try this. You know, it was it was just too dangerous. Uh, it wasn't something that anybody had ever done before. Uh, and so Ken went out, refueled, came back. We kept doing it. It's, it's getting dark. And about this time, two Navy A7s are up above us, and they have got little Shrike anti-radiation missiles. So they're not like a wild weasel with all the fancy gear. They've just got a radar homing and warning thing, but they can shoot a strike, a shrike at a SAM site. And the A7, Navy A7 says to the Sandys and the Jollies, we have got a, an active SA2 uh, pre-launch signal. And about this time, this SA2 comes out of the clouds and, and basically the three of us are in this circle and it went, the missile went right by us in the middle of the circle with the booster still on it in this great big long thing and you see the booster separate and then the missile, it, whatever they shot it at, I think they were trying to scare us off. And we said, oh. And so I said, you know, SA2, you know, headed, headed northwest and, and uh, one of the A7s says on the radio, that wasn't an SA-2, that was our Shrike that we shot at the SAM site. And, and my wingman says, hey, whatever his call sign was, he said, I think we know the difference of a 15 foot long missile coming out of the clouds going by us and your little Shrike coming down out of the sky into the clouds. <laughs> but it was an interesting conversation because we never could figure out how if these guys were the ones that alerted us, why they didn't see the missile, oh, yeah. uh, you know, that, that, that went by all of us. So anyway, that was my close encounter with an SA-2 that obviously was not a threat to us because it couldn't even guide. It was just, you know, it was just, we don't know why, what he shot it at or why they shot it. But anyway, Ken Ernst made three runs and the sun went down. And the thing we realized was that our survivor was very badly injured. It was a lieutenant colonel named Bob Belli, B-E-L-L-I, and he was the, the pilot of the Wild Weasel. And as it turned out, he had a dislocated knee and a compound fracture of his upper left arm. Compound meaning it yeah, was boy, sticking, sticking through the skin. So imagine this guy's in a cold, wet jungle. He's on the ground. He's got water, he's got good radio and good battery, but he's not in good physical shape. So one of the things that I asked for, that we always did, that I was pretty comfortable with, I said to the nail, I said, you guys have got to have somebody out here all night over the top of him, making sure you're talking to him. Because we don't want this guy to pass out when we get back here in the morning and we can't figure out where he is because he's not physically able to talk. So we went back. Um, Sandy pilots don't get any sleep when you know that you're going to have the 4 a.m. first light briefing the next morning. And I went back and for some reason, uh, the wing commander and the squadron commander, I said, look, you can put somebody else out there, but I really ought to do this because I'm the guy that A, knows where he is and B, knows how to run this crazy vectoring system that we were using, which nobody had ever even thought about that. This was a, this was a first ever use of such a crazy way. Cause normally you're looking down, you're looking at the helicopter. You say, go that way. Cause you know, you can see the ground. We, we get up and brief at four o'clock. Uh, I've now got an even more experienced wingman. I've got major Zeke and Cenas on my wing, which was phenomenal. Uh, and I've also got Dan Gibson, the OV 10, 
Pavenail back again, which is great. Um, and I've got Ken Ernst back, which is the most important thing that I get because he's the guy that's doing all the work in the Jolly. And we immediately, and the weather is identical. It had not gotten worse, it has not gotten better, it looks the very same. And Bob Belli is still talking to us in the morning. And we said, we're going to get you. Well, now it really gets interesting. In the briefing, big briefing room in the, at NKP, Captain Bill Berner, who is the hobo flight surgeon and an amazing doctor, uh, has said, I'm going to fly on the Jolly. So Bill Berner puts on his combat vest and his gun and you know, gets on the Jolly Green with Ken Ernst and his crew. And so we start down, and this is, the sun just comes up, so it's 6.30 in the morning, and Ken is creeping along, and all of a sudden, he stops and says, we just found Ashcan 01 Bravo. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, parachute is hung up in the very top of the jungle canopy, and Bravo is hanging in the parachute, lifeless. And they sat there and hovered, and Bill Berner, the doctor, is looking out, and he says, he is, he's not alive, he couldn't be alive, he couldn't have hung there for this many hours and be alive. And as it turns out, once we later learn from Bob Belli, he probably died in the high-speed ejection. It probably broke his neck or something, but anyway, so here's, and we all agreed instantly that as much as we would like to send the PJ down and recover Bravo's body, that wasn't the right thing to do. The right thing was to keep going to try to get Alpha. And sure enough, one refueling later and back in, the Ashcan Bob Belli says, I hear the helicopter. And I said, you got your compass? And he said, I do. I said, okay, you vector the helicopter. So Bob Belli basically talks the jolly the last 100 yards or however far it was. PJ has to go down because Belli can't, I mean, if you've got a dislocated you know, knee, PJ gets him on, hoists him up, and the most amazing thing was for all of us to watch this 80,000 pound helicopter just levitate out of the clouds and turn and, and head back to NKP. Wow. And the good thing was you had Bill Berner, our doctor, on the helicopter. So he's administering to this badly wounded, you know, he's got Novocaine and all these things. And so we had quite a celebration when we got back to NKP. So that's the story of Ash, and I got to meet Bel Bob Belli 15 years later in Washington, um, and he's no longer with us, but I, I got to visit with him and, and he bought me a drink or two. Oh, I imagine he did, <laughs> I imagine he did. Um, it sounds like that was quite the innovation. And it was, it was, it was, figure out how to do something on the spot that's never been done before. And the thing that was so neat to me about it was, once we figured out Ken Ernst felt safe, I mean, I was scared to death just thinking about him hovering in the weather. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. But once we figured out that he was completely comfortable doing that, and I talked to his crew afterwards and they said, Oh, he was just like iron. He, you know, he was going to do this, and we weren't scared because, you know, it was clear he wasn't. He was, he was, you know, in charge. But it was an amazing rescue, and so a bunch of us ended up going to Saigon to brief the generals about how this happened, and they couldn't believe it, and we couldn't believe it either. But it worked. Take one. Fast movers in the night.